My name is Michael Graham Espy, and I'm a program director uh, in the NCI Division of Cancer Biology, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, WALS lecture speaker, Navdeep Chandel, or Nav as uh, uh, his friends call him. Nav received his PhD and uh, postdoctoral training at the University of Chicago in cellular physiology with Paul Shoemaker and Craig Thompson. He's currently the David Chugel Distinguished Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University and is an NCI Outstanding Investigator Awardee. Nav began his studies on the molecular and cellular basis of oxygen sensing, which naturally uh, led his curiosity to an ever-deepening understanding of mitochondrial metabolism in diverse cell types. Uh, beginning almost uh, 20 years ago to the present day, Nava has developed the concept of mitochondria serving beyond the more traditional viewpoint of biosynthetic and bioenergetic organelles to include a third distinct role as signaling hubs whereby the physiologic release of reactive oxygen species and metabolites regulate transcription factors, epigenetics, uh, and uh, to control diverse cellular functions. His recent work has focused on the essentiality of mitochondrial metabolic and ROS signaling to control stem cell fate, uh, involving um, control of cancer cell phenotype, and adaptive immunity, as you'll see in the presentation today. In addition to being a champion of basic science, uh, Nav has recently leveraged his transdisciplinary understanding of the mitochondria uh, towards a more translational repurposing of the anti-diabetes drug metformin as a potential cancer therapeutic. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite our friend Nav Chandel up to give today's Walls Lecture. OK. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? OK, great. Um, Thanks again, uh, Michael, and uh, the folks at the NCI, as well as the NIH here, for this, uh, this real honor to give a, the Walls Lecture. As you can see from my title, um, it's, uh, I'm going to talk about mitochondria and how mitochondria, are, we think, are essential players in uh, normal physiology and control of homeostasis, as, as well as how mitochondria can be uh, co-opted in different pathologies. And much of what I'm going to talk to you is about, uh, as it, the title says, Beyond ATP. Uh, and hopefully uh, you'll see why I think that. So uh, the, the, the most important slide uh, is this one, because uh, the work that I'm going to present today is an unpublished story from Sam Weinberg, who's an MD-PhD student in my laboratory. And he's been helped by uh, two other people in the laboratory, Elizabeth Steinert and Manan Mehta. And we're talking about some previous data from Laura Senna, Frank Weinberg, and Lucas Sullivan. I've had some great collaborators over the years, uh, and, and current ones as well, Ben Singer, Paul Schumacher, and Northwestern Penga, who does our metabolomics, and Carlos Martinez, who's been helping us do some of our RNA sequencing, and Larry Turka, who's well known for his work in uh, T-cells, has been uh, giving us some uh, uh, friendly advice and uh, uh, tutoring about T-cell biology. So. Uh, we have a sort of a very simple question in the laboratory, eh, which is why any mammalian cell respires, right? right? I mean, if you think about it, it's almost uh, uh, an obvious question. You have a mitochondria, it uses oxygen, uh, and generates ATP, and you assume that's the only reason why we have mitochondria, right? And here's some cells which are found in sort of the, the general tumor microenvironment that we're interested in. We started much of our work in tumor cells, but it occurred to us that the tumors have T cells around them, macrophages, endothelial cells. And then also we started to think, what about other perhaps proliferating cells, right? They're like stem cells. What is the metabolism of normal cells? And this is sort of a, a question that we've been uh, interested in. Now, just to get you all caught up on uh, the simple biochemistry of mitochondria, as many of you know, the, there's a respiratory chain and, um, and the, uh, these, uh, the respiratory chain uh, dumps electrons finally to molecular oxygen, and this is coupled to a proton motive force, which generates ATP. I think everybody's comfortable with this idea. It's true. It still holds true. But lots of cells do this, right? 
Uh, the second thing, which was actually the original function of mitochondria, well before oxidative phosphorylation and, uh, was worked out, is that the TCA cycle metabolites, uh, and the TCA cycle is coupled to the respiratory chain because the TCA cycle uses NAD and FAD, and they become FADH and NADH, and the electron transport chain or the respiratory chain will make NADH back to NAD so it can keep the cycle going. And these metabolites of the TCA cycle are important for macromolecule synthesis. So if you just go back to uh, the great biochemistry books like uh, Leninger and other books, you just follow the carbons. You know, how do you get to a nucleotide? How do you get to a, 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 a lipid? How do you get to proteins? Amino acids, much of the backbones come from, in part from the TCA. Cycle. And historically, these are the two functions that have been ascribed to mitochondria. They're there to provide you energy and to give you metabolites for growth. However, uh, we've argued uh, there's a third function. It seems obvious today, but when we first thought about this more than 20 years ago, uh, we had a little bit of a pushback. Okay, and the reason was the way uh, many of us were taught biology and where mitochondria sits within a cell is the following. If you have a physiologic signal, right? If, for example, the T cells have to respond to an antigen, or you have to respond to growth factors as to proliferate or to cellular differentiation, any of these physiological processes at the cellular molecular level, we're sort of hardwired to think those signals are integrated by signal transduction mechanisms, eventually funnel into gene transcriptional networks, as well as remodeling of the chromatin, and, and then that cell will do whatever it's supposed to do, whether it proliferate, differentiate, it makes cytokines, et cetera, right? And in that model, well, once all of this action has happened at the signaling level and the gene transcription chromatin remodeling, then it just feeds back on the mitochondria and says, I'm going to double myself, proliferate, or I'm going to differentiate, or I'm going to make all these cytokines. Give me whatever energy or biosynthesis uh, capacity I need. It, and this is almost, in a way, sort of a passive player in this process, just responding to downstream signaling and, and gene expression or chromatin remodeling, right? And, and for us, it didn't quite make sense because this would be like getting in your car every morning and not knowing how much fuel you have, right? Uh, and so one simple thing that we thought of is that perhaps mitochondria are not so passive, but they're actually part of that active decision-making process as to determine cell fate and cell function. Uh, a, a, a cartoonistic way of thinking about this is if you have those signals, yes, they activate many of the same signal transduction pathways and try to remodel chromatin and genes, but they have to go through an obligatory step, which is to, is to assess the mitochondrial fitness. In other words, signals that have to communicate from the mitochondria uh, onto uh, the nucleus, right? And what would these signals be? Now, uh, we got inspired by two findings. Uh, when we first reported this paper on hypoxia uh, control of the HIFs, which is the dominant transcription factor in a hypoxia, what the signal could be. So when Zhao Dang Wang and colleagues found cytochrome C release uh, that happened under cell death, we started to think, gee, mitochondria must be releasing things. Of course, that signal was a death signal. And we thought, well, mitochondria obviously are so selected for a positive signal or beneficial signal. Well, one obvious one was reactive oxygen species. And uh, Sugo Ri, who's luckily here back from Korea, was one of the pioneers who proposed that uh, and did some of the early work showing the reactive oxygen species could be a, a signaling molecule. And I think that biology continues to expand. And, and uh, Sugori and Torn Finkel and others who were working on this had proposed NADPH oxidase as being one of the critical uh, generators of ROS. And we thought, well, maybe the mitochondria could also be that generator of ROS. Uh, people didn't like that idea because, and their simplistic notion, mitochondria only generated ROS when they were damaged. And this explained neurodegeneration. Maybe this explained heart failure or the free radical theory of aging, and this whole idea that mitochondria are bad actors. And, and so one of the things we continue to show over the years was that that's not quite true, right? In many instances, we think mitochondria do release reactive oxygen species under physiological stimuli to control a variety of important transcriptional nodes, including not signaling HIF, and NF kappa B. And so the respiratory chain isn't perfect, and the electrons from this chain can leak out to make superoxide and hydrogen peroxide to make these mitochondrial reactive oxygen species that are released under a variety of stimuluses is to control uh, these uh, very important transcriptional uh, networks. 
The other thing was that uh, uh, more than uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago also, uh, we were d uh, the epigenetic and the chromatin fields were discovering all the enzymes as over the past two decades, like the histone acetylases or the lysine demethylases that control chromatin remodeling, right? right? One thing that was obvious to someone who works on mitochondria is, gee, isn't it interesting? They all use TCA cyclometabolites to work. Right? It, where does your acetyl-CoA come from or your alpha-ketoglutarate to, to make these demethylases work? And things like succinate are powerful inhibitors of potentially of these demethylases. I, I have a, quite a wonderful uh, colleagues at Northwestern, including uh, our biochemistry chair, Ali Shaladafard, many of you know for his uh, work in the chromatin field. I joke to him all the time that you know, he's just looking at an output of mitochondria when he studies epigenetics because all of these things we've been able to link for, to the TCA cycle metabolites controlling the histone acetylation. So if we restrict the generation of citrate here, we can impact histone acetylation, and we've published on this before. So in thinking about what functionally mitochondria do, I think we can all, uh, many of us are comfortable that they, the mitochondria might be important for survival by uh, generating ATP and keeping the ATP-ADP ratio high to drive many cellular reactions. Just remember that glycolysis can compensate because it can also generate ATP. The other one is that it's important for biosynthesis. So in other words, macromolecule uh, lipids, nucleotides, many of the macromolecule synthesis also uh, comes from mitochondria, so it's a biosynthetic organelle. And then the third function, and this is what my lab's really worked a lot on, is this idea that there's things being released from mitochondria, metabolites or reactive oxygen species, which can then control transcription and through either chromatin remodeling or, or directly by uh, activating transcription factors. And so with that uh, as a background of what we think mitochondria do, the three distinct functions, is, uh, it plays out very differently in different cell types in vivo. Right? So it seems like the cancer cells use uh, mitochondrial metabolism really for growth and survival, where stem cells, uh, and, and in particular hematopoietic stem cells that we've worked on, they really don't care about their ability to uh, proliferate. Right? So if we knock out uh, the same uh, 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 respiratory chain genes in a cancer cell compared to a stem cells, it's completely different. The stem cells continue to proliferate. Right? The fetal stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, will proliferate, but they won't differentiate into progenitors. And it's the adult ones, which tend to be quiescent, and lose quiescence, and undergo actually hyperproliferation and, and stem cell exhaustion, right? Completely different than the cancer. And why that is, we're still trying to figure out. And finally, in T cells, it seems to be all about their ability uh, to function. So if it's a regular T cell, it doesn't suppress. And I'll show you what I mean. So uh, I can't go into all these uh, model systems, but I, as a simple com uh, compare and contrast in vivo, I'll focus a little bit on cancer and a little bit on regulatory T cells just to show you an example. So we got into the uh, cancer metabolism field uh, more than oh, about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, as you know, that uh, the cancer metabolism field has been revived, in part uh, by an old observation made by Otto Warburg more, uh, almost uh, 90 years ago now, which he observed that uh, a, a, a cancer tissue under normal oxygen conditions right on the laboratory bench would make lots of lactate. And this is called the aerobic glycolysis or the Warburg effect. Like, uh, the clinicians know that using PET... Uh, imagery you can see uh, with a glucose tracer, PET positive, right? So, so yes, tumors are glycolytic. Uh, and there's been a lot of hype around that to the point where people think that the mitochondria are dispensable in cancer. Or, so we said, well, that doesn't make sense to us based on our simple biochemistry knowledge of what mitochondria do. Uh, and we invested early on in making mouse models, uh, using mouse models of cancer, like the ones that Tyler Jacks and uh, Dave Tuvison and others have pioneered, but also making some models that we could use in vivo to test the necessity of the respiratory chain. So one of the ones that we made was TFAM. So TFAM encodes for, uh, is, a, is a nuclear protein that is necessary for mitochondrial DNA replication and transcription. So remember, the mitochondria has its own genome, and it encodes for certain key subunits of the respiratory chain. If you, and so we generate a flock smile. So wherever you knocked out TFAM, mitochondrial DNA is gone. If mitochondrial DNA is gone, guess what? A variety of the uh, uh, critical subunits of the respiratory chain are gone, and, and you don't have a mitochondria that respires. Functionally, the I mean, um, uh, uh, at a cell biology level, if you look uh, by electron microscopy, the mitochondria are there, they just don't respire. 
right? right? And so we asked what happens in one of these uh, mouse models uh, that the field uses, and the one we used is the lock stop lox KRAS, oncogenic KRAS-driven lung cancer model. So here we just uh, dump a little adenovirus CRE <clears throat> and uh, the lock stop uh, uh, lox allele is gone, and it activates oncogenic KRAS, and you see an increase in tumor burden. To the extent that you can knock out TFAM at the same time and excise the TFAM gene, we noticed a lot less tumors. So remember, by knocking out TFAM, we have made the tumors completely dependent on glycolysis, right? The ultimate Warburg cells, as I would call them, but yet you have less tumors. And this simple experiment basically told us the necessity of the respiratory chain, and at least under these mouse models, uh, for, for tumor genesis. As Mike alluded to, one of the things we also got into was metformin because the epidemiologists had noticed that people who had taken metformin for their diabetes is, uh, had a lower incidence of cancer across a variety of cancers. This has actually led to some clinical trials, including a large-scale one that's happening in Canada in breast cancer, and the results will be out next year. But, you know, sometimes when a drug is really cheap and can be easily repurposed, and obviously, unfortunately, there are patients suffering from uh, uh, the terrible disease of cancer, you sort of rush to do the clinical trials. And, and I'm not completely convinced we've been very... Um, uh, I should say we've been very thoughtful about some of these trials because it's not clear whether the anti-diabetic dose should be the dose for the anti-cancer. In fact, our studies, uh, at least in the mice, suggest that you need almost a maximal tolerated dose of metformin to have any efficacy. And not every tumor responds because in order for metformin to get into a, a tumor cell, it needs the organic cation transporters. In the absence of that transporter, you can throw buckets of millimolar amounts and nothing happens. But the other question was, what's its target? And uh, in 2000, there was two reports in JBC that s suggested that, m that mitochondria, if you give isolated mitochondria metformin, you can inhibit complex one. This is complex one. There's 45 subunits in complex one. Now, the best way to show what a drug does, I still think is the gold standard, is to find out where it binds in a particular complex or protein, mutate a certain residue so it doesn't change the catalysis of that complex or that protein, but just makes it refractory to binding, right? That would be the gold standard. I'm not a structural biologist. We didn't do an elegant experiment like that. It's a 45 subunit complex. It's pretty big, pretty complex. But we did something uh, a little clever, I think, which is we said, okay, let metformin inhibit mitochondrial complex one, and if it's necessary for its anti-tumor effects, let's, let's rescue it by, by putting in the cancer cells a protein called NDI1. NDI1 is found in yeast, and, right? It's a Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It does the same thing that complex one does, NADH to NAD. The only thing it doesn't do is it doesn't pump hydrogen gradients. And by pumping, by doing NADH to NAD, it can donate electrons to CoQ and down all the way to molecular oxygen. So it's our sort of our of a functional rescue. So uh, we did this uh, in a colon cancer model. We did this in a lung cancer model. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the, we let the tumors grow. If we give it metformin in the drinking water, we can uh, inhibit tumor genesis. If there was NDI1 there, they were refractory. They didn't care. Right? They're all isogenic controlled except plus or minus NDI1 or plus or minus metformin. Um, What's nice is that w once we published this couple of years ago, uh, a bunch of other uh, physician scientists and clinician scientists have now gone and given metformin to their patient cohorts and taken biopsies to do metabolomics. And we know a signature when mitochondrial respiratory chain is inhibited. We sort of know a metabolic signature that's consistent with that. And now well, giving metformin to those patients, you can see that signature, implying that metformin, even in human patients, is, can get into their cancer cell mitochondria and, uh, and, and, and perturb metabolism. So one of the things that we've been trying to figure out is exactly what aspects of the respiratory chain are critical. I mean, do you need all this ATP that's coming, or is it just about the metabolites? And one way we've thought about doing this is we've knocked out mitochondrial complex three. If you knock out complex three, it's right in the middle, right? These electrons aren't going to flow, and you won't proton pump. ATP is gone. The TCA cycle won't work or canonically like it should, and then uh, maybe you won't grow. Oh, and so if you knock out complex three, consistent with what everything else I've shown you, ooh, again, you get very little tumors growing out, okay? Hey, now again, 
uh, we've gotten into giving these an ancient enzymes to complement these mutations. So here's another one uh, now where we, again, we take the complex three knockouts, that's all gone. And, and here we put a protein called the alternative oxidase. It's found in plants, it's found in sea squirt, and in, in many lower organisms. And it can take electrons from Q oh, and, uh, and again uh, transform to molecular oxygen. Very similar to cytochrome C oxidase. It's, but again, here it'll allow this TCA cycle to occur because both complex one and two activity is regained because it can donate all its electrons to AOX. And when we do that, Compared to the control complex three knockouts that don't grow, here by putting back AOX, we can recover tumor genesis. Uh, so in this simple experiment, again, it starts to point that one of the key functions of, uh, of mitochondria, uh, we think, is to generate those TCA cycle metabolites it's, uh, uh, for growth. And really, uh, a, a model uh, that's emerged from, um, from my lab and uh, people like Ralph Deberdinas, who's done some nice work in, in human patients with glucose tracers, uh, as well as work of like Alec Kimmelman and others, uh, has come to, a, a, this is sort of a, a bird's eye view, that in the land of plenty, when nutrients are available, the mitochondria is a biosynthetic, bioenergetic hub uh, allowing for rapid cell proliferation. Right? It, it, can, it can give you all the lipids, it can help you make nucleotides, it can give you the energy. But as many of you know, tumors sit in harsh environments. And, and there, uh, many of the pathways that the cancer metabolism community has discovered, and we haven't contributed much to this, uh, which is things like uh, macropinocytosis or autophagy or branched-chain amino acids or fatty acid oxidation, the activation of AMPK, all these survival pathways one of their jobs is to catabolize whatever they can uh, in a cell to feed the mitochondria, make enough energy so you can at least survive until you get neovascularization and you go back to the land of plenty eh, so to grow out. So under both conditions, and a nutrient replete condition is an anabolic machinery and a nutrient depleted it, it's a catabolic like, machinery to generate ATP for survival. And I think this is a model that we continue to test, and obviously we're looking for nodes uh, that uh, uh, we can interfere with uh, for, for, uh, for cancer therapy. So the, really the take home here is that we think the in vivo role of the respiratory chain and is, is uh, control proliferation and survival. Uh, I won't have time to show you the stem cell data, but we can do similar genetic tricks, knocking out complex three or other ways to knock out the respiratory chain. As I alluded to, the stem cells themselves are there. They're phenotypically, they look like stem cells, but they don't do what they're supposed to do, which is generate progenitors. Right, so they don't have a proliferative defect, unlike the cancer cells in vivo, but they have uh, a differentiation defect. Uh, and the T cells, which I'm gonna show you, is all about their function. Right? And, and so we got into this uh, almost seven, eight years ago, uh, a talented MD, PhD student, Laura Senna. Uh, and again, we were sort of watching the field of amino metabolism that continues to grow and evolve. Uh, and uh, again, there the historic bias has always been that they're very glycolytic, right? And, and in fact, uh, rapidly proliferating cells do show robust glycolysis, but that's not it uh, should not be uh, misinterpreted that their mitochondria are not equally important. And so again, uh, we do very simple experiments. We ask the question, uh, is the respiratory chain necessary for proliferation or T-cell activation? And, and could we use some of our newer mouse models? So one of the ones we've been using is uh, knocking out the catalytic subunit of complex three. So complex three has 11 subunits. The risky iron sulfur protein uh, is encoded by the nucleus. So again, we can flock these alleles. Let's knock out complex three, cross it to CD4 Cree, and again, the respiratory chain won't work. If the respiratory chain doesn't work, you don't make ATP, obviously. Okay? So these cells become purely glycolytic. Their growth may be compromised because you may not make enough TCA cycle metabolites. Uh, the ROS uh, that's being generated by complex three for signaling might be affected. The metabolites for histone acetylation would be affected. So there are going to be multiple effects, and it gets quite difficult to start discerning all the uh, reasons why. But uh, Laura initially did some uh, simple experiments. One of them is you can take a, a RAG-deficient mouse, a lymphopenic mouse, and adoptively transfer either wild-type or risp knockout. This is sort of this homeostatic expansion of T-cells, a, a very uh, bread-and-butter assay of the community. And what she noticed was no phenotype. The wild-type cells, if you wild-type T cells, you put them in this RAG-deficient mouse, 
it proliferates fine, as others have shown, and so do our complex three knockouts. We suggested that there's no growth defect. Um, I did remind uh, Laura that, you know, the T cells uh, are there to respond to antigens, that perhaps uh, she should try a variety of antigens. And when she did that, she got the opposite response. So they have the ability to grow under these homeostatic conditions. They just don't do it when they have to respond to an antigen. And that started to smell like signaling because they can find a way to grow and survive and under one condition but not the other. And with that, going through a, a lot of the mechanistic details as this was published a while back, and I want to show you some of our more recent unpublished data, but this is sort of was a, was a nice experiment. So remember, the complex three NACAs are purely glycolytic, so you could argue there's something about that the fact that they're too glycolytic or something about energy that was a problem, but we, like, the signaling paradigm, and one of the ways we think signaling is by generating mitochondrial ROS. So if you look at IL-2 production, this is in cell culture, the wild-type cells, when they're stimulated, they make IL-2, the classical cytokine of T cells being activated. In the complex three knockouts, or RISP knockouts, there's this mark reduction. And, and then all we do is we titrate in nanomolar amounts of galactose, uh, of uh, H2O2, and we do it by giving galactose oxidase and galactose. Uh, so Galactose is the substrate for galactose oxidase, and we can titrate the substrate, substrate and, the, uh, and the enzyme concentration and to whatever level we want. We can generate nanomolar, micromolar, millimolar amounts of H2O2 continuously. And by just flooding the system with nanomolar amounts of H2O2, we asked whether in our risk knockout uh, we can bring back the IL-2, and we can, right? So the black bars are the risk knockout. So they have very little IL-2 when they're stimulated. As long as we provide them only one thing back, H2O2, we can bring back uh, IL-2 levels. And that suggested that one of the things that was important uh, in the absence of complex three was perhaps a ROS uh, production from complex three. And we showed that we're using dyes and all sorts of other methods. But the simple mechanism that we outlined was that the early signal, uh, once you activate the T cell by the T cell receptor engagement, is an influx of calcium. That's one of the earliest signals you can detect. And, and in large part, that signal was intact in our knockouts. What wasn't intact was the generation of hydrogen peroxide in our knockouts, and, uh, and that was necessary for NFAT translocation in, uh, into the nucleus for IL-2 production. As many of you know, NFAT is one of the key transcription factors that's necessary for IL-2. NF-kappa B and AP1 are the other two, and they were not in affected, so there was some specificity to this pathway. Okay. And so the idea we, sh uh, we had is that uh, the calcium would enter the mitochondria where it would activate the dehydrogenases is to pump up and rev up mitochondrial uh, uh, respiratory chain activity, and a byproduct of that is H2O2, which would then uh, uh, allow uh, for this NFAT-dependent IL-2 production. So... Uh, uh, when Sam Weinberg, uh, a talented MD-PhD who was graduating next month, um, wanted to follow up uh, and start to ask, uh, you know, beyond activation, what are the different subsets? As you know, how, how does, uh, what is the role of the respiratory chain in a memory cell or in an effector cell or in a regulatory T cells? And we like the regulatory T cells because there's a lot of nice literature in regulatory T cells. was also uh, much of how the Treg regulatory T cell literature, there's a lot of epigenetic control of Treg function, which to us, like I said, uh, we like to think of uh, chromatin remodeling in the epigenetic landscape because it's, uh, it's, we can see how it nicely ties into mitochondria function because many of the TCA psychometabolize control uh, those enzymes. So again, it's a very similar approach. We take the FOXP3 Cree, eh, and these mice uh, also have a, a YFP, so you can tag them if the, if the Cree is active, if, and uh, cross it again to the complex 3, the RISP FLOX mice. So you have complex 3 gone again, and what happens? And he got a completely astounding result which is he got a mouse that looks like a FOXP3 null mouse. So FOXP3 is the, 
is sort of the, 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 the lineage-specific transcription factor necessary for regulatory T cell function. If you lose FOXP3 in a mouse, you get the scurfy mouse, in three weeks the mouse dies. There's autoimmunity, uh, there's immune dysregulation everywhere, there's hyperinflammation, and uh, patients uh, that have mutations in FOXP3 also have, have this sort of uh, hyperinflammation, uh, immune dysregulation. And we got the only mouse that I know that almost phenocopies a scurfy mouse, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, and, and you know, genetics don't lie, but sometimes they do. And so we just made sure if that's true, we should take another subunit of complex three. There's 11 subunits. One of them is encoded by the mitochondrial DNA. The other 10 and are nuclear encoded, and all of those 10 are all necessary for the complex. If you lose any one of them, the complex doesn't work well. well and this is the QPC protein, and we got an identical phenotype. So all the data I'm showing you, we, we sort of uh, uh, phenocopied with each other mouse, right? That was good. So even though we were quite excited by this finding, uh, there was one simple experiment Sam had to do for me to get excited. I'm like, listen. If you show this to anybody, all they're going to say is you have a dead mouse because you had no T-regs, right? You've got a mouse that the T-regs needed for survival. So tell me what the T-reg numbers are. And if they're completely gone or they're really low, it's a cool finding, but it ain't that cool. You need an ATP or something like that, right? And what he found was the opposite. The number of FOXP3 positive cells were identical between, well, in fact, there were a little bit more in the complex in Naka, like they were, right? And, and you can see if you take out these numbers out and you put KI67 or CD44, which is an activation marker, phenotypically, we've got plenty of FOXP3 positive so-called Tregs that proliferate, uh, that look like they're activated, they're surviving, they're proliferating. So we're down to the last function, right? Are they suppressive? Have. And here I'm showing you, we've done the in vitro suppression assays, and they don't suppress very well. Here's the in vivo. Oh, and this is where, again, we go back into uh, the, the, the rag mice, where we either give uh, a wild-type effector cells, and you can see these mice develop, uh, uh, they develop colitis and uh, immune dysregulation, and they die. If you give the wild-type effectors with the wild-type T regs, right, Right? You give enough Tregs, that's your suppressed effector cells, a classic suppression assay. The mice survive, right? But now you redo that experiment where you give the wild type effectors with the knockout Tregs, and again, it looks like they never got any uh, uh, regulatory T cells, right? And this told us that we have Tregs that are there, they can proliferate, they can survive based on many markers that would be called essential for Tregs. There are, many of them are there, including CTLA-4, FOXP3, but they just don't suppress. As, and another experiment we can do, now we go to an inducible system. So instead of using the FOXP3 CRE, which comes out in development, this is the FOXP3 tamoxifen inducible CRE. So we let the mice get to adult, adult and now uh, we add a B16 melanoma, the classic sort of, uh, you know, in my lab, uh, we don't try to reinvent too many of these techniques uh, other than our mitochondrial stuff. Of, and, uh, you know, you get a nice tumor that grows out. And now we're adding tamoxifen and, and uh, only, and remember, the tamoxifen should activate CRE only in the FOXP3 positive cells, the Treg cells. And by knocking out complex 3 inducibly in the regulatory T cells, was, obviously we've allowed these Tregs to stop suppressing and unleash uh, immunity, and, uh, and, and they make you know, very small tumors that eventually get cleared out. Right? And so that that's, tells us that Complex 3 is necessary for Treg function. The question is why. So here, what we've done is we've taken the Tregs out and shot it through RNA-seq analysis just to get an idea of what's up and what's down. Um, the number one pathway we consistently see in vivo when mitochondria are, uh, the respiratory chain is impaired in our stem cells and our T cells, well, so far as MYC. MYC tends to be up, and so does mTORC1. Uh, they, those pathways tend to be up. Uh, and it's almost as if the system must send some, uh, something's wrong and it's trying to compensate by activating. And remember, MYC and mTORC1 
are the two of the pathways that control metabolism. MIC almost regulates just about every metabolic gene, and mTORC phosphorylates many substrates in the lipogenesis and nucleotide synthesis pathway. So this must be sort of a, a feedback on the system. But the other thing was what's down-regulated, right? We think that it must be down-regulating suppressive genes. And it's two obvious ones were FOXP3 and CTLA4, but they weren't. And, but then we um, started to look into this a little bit more, and here's some genes that have, uh, that have been associated to suppressive regulatory T cell function. And in fact, if you lose any one of these genes, specifically in regulatory T cells, eventually you develop an autoimmune like disorder. Some of these, like neuropelin 1, takes more than a year, some of them less. Uh, but remember, we're having a whole host of these genes all uh, coordinatedly downregulated. It's almost like uh, we've made multiple knockouts of uh, uh, all in one. Um, and so how do you coordinate a, a widespread uh, suppressive uh, uh, genome downregulation? And, and what are some of these, uh, you know, how do you get all of these genes perhaps to downregulate? And so this is where we turn a little bit to DNA methylation and histone methylation. And so there's a large family uh, of enzymes now called the alpha keto glutarate dependent dioxygenases. I think uh, uh, my, my colleague from the hypoxia community and friend uh, Bill Kalin gave the walls a couple of weeks ago, and, and he was really a pioneer in figuring out one of the early ones, which is the EGL9, the proleal hydroxylases. So these are the uh, regulators of HIF, right? So they control hydroxylation of HIF, and they're alpha keto glutarate dependent. And, and some of the other ones are the Jumanji domain, the TET enzymes uh, uh, that are, participate in DNA demethylation, and so the histone lysine demethylation, the DNA demethylation, all these reactions are driven by alpha ketoglutarate. They use oxygen, they make CO2, they use iron, and, and uh, the byproduct is succinate. All you have to do is go to your PubMed, uh, alpha ketoglutarate is mitochondria. Iron is controlled by mitochondria. Oxygen availability is controlled by mitochondria. Succinate is generated in the mitochondria. You can see how early in evolution, and the one way that mitochondria might have communicated uh, to the nucleus uh, or to the cytoplasm is through these enzymes because it, it can potentially control the activity uh, by uh, all a variety of ways. One thing that's come out of the people who've studied these uh, enzymes is the most potent regulator is 2-hydroxyglutarate. Succinate will also uh, will inhibit this enzyme, but not as effectively as 2-hydroxyglutarate. Right? And remember, 2-AG and alpha-ketoglutarate are the same molecule. One is this oxidized and reduced versions of it. Right? The cancer people all know about 2-hydroxyglutarate. Right? This is the excitement that's gone in the cancer metabolism field because the IDH1 and 2 mutations that are found in gliomas and AML make 2-hydroxyglutarate. And much of our understanding of what 2-hydroxyglutarate funneling into this, uh, these enzymes comes from that literature. Now, the type of 2-hydroxyglutarate that the IDH mutations make is the R form or the D form. So remember, there's chirality. There's another version called the L form right, or the S form that every person in this room can make without that IDH mutation. Plants make it. It's been conserved throughout evolution, okay? And I want to talk about how do you make not the IDH mutation version of 2-AG, but the L, because I think the implication of this is much broader, and I'll tell you why in a second. So the way you make L2-AG, or the S2-AG, the L2-AG, is, is you only make it when NADH levels are high, right? And NADH levels are high if the respiratory chain is inhibited or impaired, right? Remember, complex one's job is to take NADH, make NAD. So most of us have a lot more NAD than NADH in our mitochondria. But if you're severely hypoxic, or if we take a poison that uh, inhibits uh, our respiratory chain, or as many have alluded, that diseases like Parkinson's or natural aging, you see a downregulation of the respiratory chain, and you start to see a buildup of NADH compared to NAD, and there's a whole literature around gi giving NAD supplements now. Uh, and I've asked people, what does NAD do? And I think this is one explanation. And when the NADH levels increase compared to NAD, malate dehydrogenases, and remember, malate dehydrogenase takes malate usually, 
and converts to oxaloacetate, right? Malate is its natural preferred substrate, but it will promiscuously utilize alpha-ketoglutarate, and if there's a lot of NADH around, it will, the maladehydrogenases will convert this to 2-hydroxyglutarate, right? The key is you need that NADH to drive this reaction. And once you have the 2-AG, there's an enzyme called 2-hydroxyglutarate dehydrogenase that will get rid of the 2-AG buildup. And the brain has the highest levels of 2-hydroxyglutarate dehydrogenase. Patients which have a mutation in that enzyme will slowly accumulate 2-AG, and they get all sorts of neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative phenotypes. So we can see how 2-AG might be linked to neurodegeneration. One key thing is this enzyme is completely dependent on dumping its electrons to complex 3. So when we knock out complex 3, and we first did it in our stem cells in vivo, uh, we saw a lot of 2-AG accumulating up to a millimolar. And it's being driven because the NADH builds up in our complex 3 knockouts, and you can't get rid of it. The other place is, is LDH uh, with acidic pH can also generate 2-HG. So highly glycolytic cells those can also start to kill. But again, you need the NADH to drive that. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've now have many ways to reconstitute, um, with, again, with ancient enzymes, um, replenish the NAD pool in our complex 3 knockouts, and we can uh, bring down the 2-AG. So we're quite confident that this is the mechanism by which you generate the 2-AG, an NAD malate dehydrogenase dependent system. And so, again, the key is whether that 2-hydroxyglutarate it, uh, accumulates in our Tregs. And it turns out that the wild types have almost like 50 to 100 micromolar, or, and uh, uh, it accumulates up to, you know, somewhere between 3 to 400 micromolar. But the key is how does it translate to alpha-KG, right? Because it has to outcompete the alpha-KG. And we start to see, again, this is doing metabolomics right out of the mouse. Uh, of a mouse that's going to die within three weeks uh, right before it, and we just take it out and shoot it through mass spec, these Fox P3. The succinate ratio to alpha KG also goes up. up. And so the question is, uh, does this correlate with anything to do with DNA methylation, right? So uh, the TED enzymes are, uh, participate in DNA methylation, and they've been shown in vitro uh, to be very sensitive both to alpha KG and the succinate. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, they are alpha KG dependent, and they're sensitive to 2AG and succinate. So, if you put in 2AG or succinate, it, you can start to see hypermethylation of DNA. And so, what we did is we went back to our RNA seq and said, let's look at the 200 genes that are downregulated, and now do the bisulfite DNA uh, methylation sequencing. And now, looking at the top. Uh, uh, downregulated genes, and if you look at their CPG islands, as you see a hypermethylation compared to the wild type, right? So there is a correlation between the loss of complex 3, the loss of suppressive function, downregulation of key suppressive genes, hypermethylation of the DNA, and increase in things like 2-hydroxyglutarate and succinate. They're all correlative. Uh, and now, the reason I keep on saying, and I'm very careful about this, uh, one of you know, I, my original degree was in math, and one thing you learn over and over is causality. Unfortunately, we don't, I don't have a good causal experiment, right? The causal experiment would be to take our complex three knockouts and find a way to get rid of 2-hydroxyglutarate and fix the phenotype, if that's the driver, right? The best way would be to overexpress this enzyme. We can't, and we've tried. The problem is it's dependent on complex three knockouts. If we had a complex one knockout, which would allow the NADH to build up and make 2-hydroxyglutarate, we could, in that system, overexpress 2-hydroxyglutarate because complex 3 is intact when complex 1 is knocked out, right? So, um, so we're going back and doing those sort of experiments, but one experiment we can do is sort of an in vitro sufficiency. We can take our FOXP3 null, oh, I mean, fo wild-type FOXP3 right out of a mouse, give it all the cytokines, keep them happy, get them to proliferate, it, and give it 50 micromolar 2-hydroxyglutarate. 50 micromolar gives you about 400 uh, micromolar in, v in, in the cell. So if you put 50 micromolar in the cell culture, uh, and by metabolomics, you ask how much the concentration is enriched, it's almost tenfold. And it's about what we see in our knockouts. So we're on par. So in other words, you know, you could always, this is one of Mike's favorite things he likes to say, you can always dump in as much of a metabolite or a toxin until you see an effect. We were careful to put back the amount of hydroxyglutarate that we see in our knockouts to simply ask, 
whether in a wild type cell, whether giving it that amount of 2-AG sufficient to drive down regulation of some key genes, including neuropillin and TIGIT, which were the genes that we, uh, we observed were downregulated. By contrast, FOXP3, which was not downregulated, uh, uh, um, remains unchanged. So, so this sort of, you know, keeps us going down this 2-hydroxyglutarate pathway uh, going forward. But really, the, the simple take-home message is, is when we think about why in this case, why any mammalian cell respires, but in this case, Tregs, they can survive without uh, having a functional respiratory chain or functional complex three. They find a way to proliferate and grow, which I find quite fascinating. Like, how are they in vivo getting all their nutrients for growth? Uh, but what, is, what they're really using the respiratory chain is to control their suppressive function. And then in the absence of a functional respiratory chain, and then um, they don't suppress properly. Uh, and this is sort of continues to add to this idea that mitochondria communicate with the nucleus. And for a long time, we worked on this idea that mitochondria release H2O2, which will then funnel into a variety of transcriptional nodes. And I think one of the challenges for the field old, uh, that continues to happen is exactly how this H2O2 signal transduction uh, relay happens, and uh, Suguri has been a pioneer in proposing some elegant models how this works. Uh, we've been interested in taking the HIF system and figuring out what cysteine residues uh, 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 that those peroxide would uh, oxidize in the HIF pathway or in the proleal hydroxylases that would account for some of the biology. But the other thing that we're quite excited about is this idea that the TCA cycle metabolites could build up. Uh, to cause havoc, right? So in our world, H2O2 generally is a beneficial thing. It's been selected right, under physiological conditions. And where mitochondrial metabolites might be toxic is when you have respiratory impairment and, or downregulation of respiration, or somehow you have the NAD-NADH ratio of not balanced and you have too much NAD that might trigger something like 2-hydroxyglutarate, right, which can cause DNA methylation, hypermethylation. But remember, 2-hydroxyglutarate Glutarate, as I mentioned, based on the patient data, if it accumulates, it causes neurodegeneration. And, and so that sort of leads us to think that many of the NAD dependent, uh, the decrease in NAD, which is being linked to pathologies, whether 2-hydroxyglutarate is one aspect of that missing link. And because it is a neurotoxic molecule, it can cause havoc. But the other thing is whether nature also originally selected this as a, as a physiological signal during development, but but only when you accumulate to high levels, uh, it becomes a pathologic molecule, just like ROS can. And, and again, we have to develop newer and newer mouse models those to perturb NAD and ADH ratio, the 2-hydroxyglutarate, find ways more and more to sop up uh, selectively hydrogen peroxide from complex three versus other sources as to uh, uh, invoke uh, biology. Hey. Anyways, thanks again, Mike, and to the Institute, and thank you for your patience. I think I've got about 10 or 12 minutes before uh, 5 to uh, answer some questions. Great job, Nap. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for questions, please come up to the microphone. Yes, please, on the left. Uh, yeah, very nice story, particularly about the epigenetics part, but I'm a little bit confused about your assertions on H2O2. You have so much of superoxide and catalase in the mitochondria. How do you sort of account for that? Yes, excellent question. And so the question was, was how does uh, superoxide or hydrogen peroxide ever escape? Because as we know, the mitochondrial matrix is super well buffered with antioxidants, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the reasons we really like complex three as a major site for the release of superoxide is because it's the only complex or the only system within the mitochondria that generates superoxide that dumps it in the intramembrane space where it can leak out. And there's an SOD1 in the intramembrane space which can convert to peroxide and boom, you get it right out of the mitochondria or that superoxide goes through VDAC channels. And we've seen that. And so we, that's one of the reasons we really like complex three as a major site of the superoxide. And obviously, by dumping in the intermembrane space, you have accessibility to the outer membrane very quickly, where 
uh, we would argue things like proleyl hydroxylases or the direct targets of the mitochondria uh, uh, would have to be. And one of the things that supports this idea is under hypoxia, uh, and this was the work of Mark Gillespie a couple of years ago, he showed with nice fluorescent sensors and everything, as soon as you made the cells hypoxic, you know, you have this diffuse mitochondrial staining pattern. They all went perinuclear. Uh, and he could show that the mitochondria were then dumping hydrogen peroxide in that vicinity. And that was all due to complex three. Did you ever look at the glutathione and other sort of labels in these cells? Uh, yeah, so I we, mean, there are a lot of these thioredoxins and glutathione and everything else. And I'm just wondering if there is, you know, th there's just so much out there. And, and I'm. Yeah, really yeah. So, I mean, this is a more, now beyond mitochondria uh, and. Uh, and again, I, I should defer to Suguri and his work on this. I think one of the questions is, is okay, so I think I, we provided a simple explanation how complex three can actually release ROS because it's in the right compartment and that is dumping it. And then the next question is, how does that H2O2 relay its signal to eventually cause uh, uh, cysteine modifications which alter proteins? And I think there's a variety of models that have been proposed, uh, including the peroxyrodoxins themselves sort of relay it. Uh, and, uh, there's a sort of a, another model which is called the floodgate model that, again, this is the work of Suguri and colleagues. Um, and so I think those things continue to be figured out and those are still pertinent questions. Now, one more very quick question and that is, did you look at the photoreceptors in your mice? Because photoreceptors use uh, maximum amount of oxygen no, for any no. post mitotic cell. No? Yeah, no, no, no. But no. if you're interested, we're happy to send you the mice. And uh, great, great. You should uh, cross it to a Cree and see what you get. Yeah. On our right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad after two decades of um, the struggling to introduce the role of immunity in cancer. People are talking about these uh, fantastic uh, topics in, in cancer development. Uh, <clears throat> I think what you were mentioning about mitochondria going off and on and uh, being off in a way in the cancer, uh, we have detailed this, uh, what happens uh, when you induced growth promoting role of tumorogenic property of acute inflammation, you shut down the mitochondria so that the mitochondria has chance to regenerate succinate and all those other mediators that you mentioned. In this process, uh, the pyruvate shuttle to mitochondria also is affected. And my question is, when you were talking about alpha-ketoglutarate or LDH, have you looked at, the, at, uh, at some of the metabolism of the macromolecules that are also needed, uh, the energy for uh, metabolizing um, essential amino acids, valine, yeah, the branch chain amino acids. The, right. right. Have you looked at those? Right. And also many other components. This is a very interesting topic. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, thank you for bringing up. Yeah, uh, I, we have not, but the community is very interested in branch chain amino acids. Uh, as you know, as you're pointing out, one of the places they'd like to dump the carbons eventually is one is to acetyl-CoA, like leucine can, and the other one of uh, valine is onto succinyl-CoA, and this can fulfill the TCA cycle. Uh, I think there's been a almost a very simplistic view that everything is about glucose to pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and glutamine to alpha-ketoglutarate, no. but one of the ones which can do it, we find, at least in cell culture, that can substitute very well for that in some settings is branched-chain amino acids. And as you know, branched-chain amino acids are elevated very early in like pancreatic cancer. And so I've argued that you know, uh, there's good reasons to think about branched-chain amino acid metabolism as sort of uh, uh, anaplerotic, um, uh, fulfilling the TCA cycle metabolites. And uh, 
but we haven't ourselves manipulated that system. I know there are others that are interested in doing it's that. It's a very fascinating topic. Great. I've published it recently, and if you're interested, we can yeah, discuss. Great. Thank you. Thank you. On our left. So in the uh, T-Reg uh, yeah. setup or uh, background, have you tried expressing the alternative oxidase? Because <laughs> in that case, yes. You, you, two hydroxyglutarate levels should go right. down because you can't have the electrons go out. But the alternative oxygen doesn't generate ROS like complex three does. Right. So what happens? Excellent, there? excellent. And uh, so let me just so as I showed you, the way we rescued the tumorigenicity in the cancer was we knocked out complex three. The tumors didn't grow, and we put this ancient enzyme alternative oxidase, which would allow complex one and two to work in the absence of three, and it rescued the tumors, because it allows the metabolites to come back, and the 2-AG does go down in that setting. We've done those experiments. So now, we should be able to use the same strategy uh, in our T-Rex. So we've generated a conditional lock stop locks in the Rosa locus of the AOX, uh, and we're now crossing that to our complex three. That's exactly, would be one of the ways. And what's nice is, as you pointed out, it doesn't rescue the ROS. All it rescues is the metabolites. Thanks. On our right. Uh, very nice. Uh, so the oncogenesis model you chose, the RAS-driven model. Yes. Um, RAS-driven oncogenesis has been shown to depend in, uh, in some part on NF-kappa-B to prevent a RAS-induced senescence. Yeah. So did you, um, did you look to see whether um, this might be dependent on NF-kappa-B? And also, if you use a non-RAS driven model, do you see a similar dependence in tumor genicity? Yeah, yeah, so we have not done the NF-kappa B. I think, um, you know, we've been um, a little naive in some of our experiments, or a little obsessed by just showing the necessity of the respiratory chain, and then complementing with all these ancient enzymes to figure out exactly what aspect of the respiratory chain. But as we're getting closer to that, now the next step is, okay, so then what, right? right? And that that's, uh, for us, uh, both NF-kappa B and HIFs are, are continue to be the ones that we're most intrigued by. Um, your second question was about? Uh, just whether. Oh, uh, if, whether if other models. Non -RAS, yeah. A non-RAS model. Right, right, non-RAS. Yeah, so we've done, we've, done, um, uh, we've done a MIC model, uh, um, uh, an osteosarcoma um, inducible MIC model that Dean Felsher's lab made years ago. Oh, and, uh, and the... And, and, and the results hold up in those models. I think um, more and more, uh, as there's a, people have used a variety of genetic and pharmacological ways of uh, suppressing the respiratory chain, and they're finding uh, similar things. Probably the one that I'm most excited about is that uh, cells that emerge uh, that are resistance. Uh, to a particular therapy, an anti-angiogenic therapy, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, BRAF, uh, or some uh, targeted therapies, the cells that persist for a while, uh, and they are slow growing, and might have so-called tumor initiating stem pools, stem-like problems, those cells all taught are much more sensitive to mitochondrial respiratory chain inhibitors than the original tumors. And I think that's quite exciting and, uh, uh, avenue to pursue for us definitely an emerging area. So we're going to have a reception in the NIH library uh, after this lecture, but let's thank Nav again for giving us a great uh, presentation. <laughs>